Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Braver and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today we are going to be ranking the top 10 wide receivers in NFL history. We gave a little sneak preview of some of the names in this conversation with a question that we answered on our last mailbag episode. But today we're doing the full fleshed out top 10. So Logan, why don't you get us started? Yeah, at number 10, this may surprise some people, I have Larry Fitzgerald. And the reason I think it may surprise some people is he's number two in career receiving yards. He's number two in career receptions, right? Larry has uh, a really long storied career. And uh, the gentleman that asked the question, or one of the questions on our last uh, show, uh, shout out Jonah Carell, he texted me and he was like, why didn't you mention Larry alongside some of those other great receivers? For me, he'd be top five. He'd be one of the first guys off. Well, to me, I value peak over everything when we're considering the majority of players and wide receivers one of those positions. Next, I consider how much of a threat you were at scoring. I just think scoring is one of the most valuable things in football. You have to be a great guy putting the ball in the end zone, point blank. Then I value where you were amongst your contemporaries, and then I consider longevity. Longevity is very important. I think that is a very important component of this. If you were great for five years, uh, it doesn't compare if you were great for a decade. That being said, I think one thing that concretely puts Larry Fitzgerald on this list, why he has to be in your top 10, and something that could elevate him even higher, is his 2008 playoff run. Larry still holds the record for most receiving yards and touchdowns in a single playoff run ever, with 546 receiving yards and seven touchdowns. And when you think of clutch performances, great all-time big plays, Larry shines. Larry has those couple of great moments at the end of the game against the Packers with Carson Palmer, where he goes down the field and they get points. He has that play in the Super Bowl where he absolutely burns Ike Taylor. That's what Ike Taylor was good at, getting cooked. He takes a slant, takes it up the field, and Larry burns him to the end zone in the Super Bowl. Larry was a very clutch performer on the biggest stage, but I and I also think he has some of the greatest hands of all time, up there with Chris Carter, with Marvin Harrison. But I never felt like Larry was the best receiver in football, and that's what keeps him at number 10 on my list, I think. I'd rather have Andre Johnson, I'd rather have Calvin Johnson, I'd rather have A.B., and I'd rather have Julio Jones. All of those guys Larry overlaps with. Now, Andre Johnson just barely misses my list. He's at 11 or 12. Uh, I think Andre's peak is higher, but this is where the longevity factors in. Larry has nine 1,000-yard seasons. He was an 11-time Pro Bowler, but again, just a one-time All-Pro first team, one year where he could be considered the best receiver in football. So I value Larry's peak. I think he's got one of the greatest pair of hands of all times. I think he's got an all-time playoff run, and his peak is very good. I mean, he's at the top of his game, over 1,000 yards and eight touchdowns for basically 13 seasons. That's remarkable. But I never felt like Larry was the best receiver in football, and I think you can make an argument for everybody above him on this list that they were. So Larry comes in at number 10 on my list. This is hilarious because I feel like you and I are going to be the minority here, but sometimes we're very like-minded, Logan, and I also have Larry at number 10, and it's basically because my values are the same as yours. Fundamentally, across sports, I just believe in peak over longevity when we're making these lists, and I just don't think you could look me in the eye and say that Larry was better than any of the guys that I have above him, and frankly, I don't think peak to peak, it's very close. Larry still makes this list because of the totality of his production being so stellar, and there's no doubt that his consistency is rivaled probably only by Jerry Rice throughout NFL history, but again, that's just not the most valuable thing to me. Who was the best at their best? Who could propel an offense by the most who could just singularly dominate in the red zone and with their overall yardage production and Larry just doesn't quite stack up he was top three in receiving yards once in his entire career he was a first team all pro once and his QB play isn't as good as the other guys on this list almost across the board but I also think sometimes people understate that he had seven years combined of Kurt Warner and Carson Palmer and very good versions of both of them. So yes, there were some real down stretches there, but there were also some very good stretches of quarterback play. And I just think you laid it out, man, year to year in the early stretch of Larry's career, like 05 through 07, I think best receiver in the league is probably Marvin Harrison, Reggie Wayne, Steve Smith. Those guys are all in the conversation, making at least as strong a case as Larry. And then you get to that 08, 09 range and it's Andre Johnson. And then once you're into the 2010s, it's very clearly Calvin Johnson and AB and Julio. And 
Larry just never had that mantle, and that matters a lot to me. So you mentioned it, great hands, really strong route runner, not in terms of this list, one of the more impressive dynamic downfield threats, one of the higher end athletes. So because his peak is clearly the lowest on this list, I'm going to have him at number 10, but second in yards, sixth in touchdowns, I don't think you can leave him off entirely. Yeah, and like I said too, I, again, another thing that really does play into it is the the big time stage. When Larry got there, he performed and he was a big play threat. But again, not to the other level. I just don't think Larry ever had yeah. the gravity, you know, of those other receivers. At number nine, I have Lance Allworth and a uh, bit of a throwback here, but Lance was super productive uh, at his peak. I mean, playing basically in the 60s, has seven 1,000-yard seasons, has one 1,500-yard season that totaled 1,600 yards one year. I mean, unprecedented in, in that era. Super hard to do in a non-passing era. He's a seven-time Pro Bowler and six times was all pro first team. I think that matters, again, uh, amongst his contemporaries, right? You look back at Lance Allworth highlights and something I implore you to do because it really gives you just a look at how old football was played. He's not jumping off the screen at you, right? It almost looks like it's in slow motion compared to today's athletes, but we have to judge these guys amongst their contemporaries. Six times, Lance Allworth was considered the best wideout in football. He earned that honor. He's also All-Pro second team once. Three-time league leader in touchdowns, yards, and receptions. And what I think is really remarkable when you look at the, him statistically, he's 14th in receiving yards per game. I mean, even amongst the greats of the greats in NFL history, Lance is producing at an all-time level consistent, uh, consistently. And again, in a non-passing era, super remarkable. He's also 17th in career receiving touchdowns, which I value heavily. If you're not a great guy at putting the ball in the end zone, I'm not going to put you up here. Like, uh, that's a big reason Steve Smith was probably uh, not a great example. Steve was probably in my top 20 range, but again, at his peak is averaging like six touchdowns a season. Uh, Lance is averaging a double digits, 11 touchdowns, uh, uh, you know, during his prime, basically 1,200 yards and 11 TDs in the 60s. Uh, Lance could be higher. Again, when you were looking at peak and amongst your contemporaries, a very, very high peak. But this is where the longevity factors in for me. His peak's only about seven seasons, and that's one of the shorter peaks of this um, of these guys. Julio and ABs are pretty short as well. Um, but Allworth, only seven seasons at the top. He was the best receiver in football. But this is where longevity factors in for me. But still, you look at it, a big play threat, a great red zone threat, a great pair of hands, and uh, really historic production for a guy that played in such a, <laughs> a prehistoric era of football, to say the least. He's also a uh, one-time AFL champ and one-time Super Bowl champ. Not that that matters, but I think it's interesting to, to mention among the other guys. I like how you just said not that that matters. I think what you mean is that a receiver can only contribute so much to winning a Super Bowl or an NFL championship. But of course, the goal is ultimately to win the most games possible and win that championship. I have Lance Allworth one spot higher than you at number eight. And again, it just comes out to completely outpacing his peers. If we were to extrapolate his stats from 63 to 68 when they're playing 14 game seasons to today's 17 game seasons, he averaged for six years, in the 1960s, the equivalent of 1,568 yards and 14.2 touchdowns, man. In that span, he had 1,300 yards and 14 touchdowns more than anybody else. So I agree, his longevity is certainly on the lower end of this list. That's why I don't have him higher, but good God, was he dominant. And you look at, for example, the 1965 season, where... The Chargers quarterbacks combined throw for under 3,400 yards, 23 touchdowns. Lance Allworth contributes 1,600 plus receiving yards, 14 touchdowns. Like he is over half of his entire team's passing attack. Absolutely ridiculous. One of the elite deep threats ever, averaged 19 yards per catch. Dominant, dominant force. At my number nine spot, though, I have another one of the most dominant forces the game has ever seen, and that's Julio Jones, who, again, may not have racked up the career totals that Larry did because of longevity. I believe that Julio was 16th in career yards, but second in yards per game, and uh, his peak was just so clearly higher to me. What he did from 2014 to 2019 averaged 1,565 yards 
in that span. At 6'3", we've just very rarely seen this blend of size and power and sub 4'4 speed with also high-level route running. He was two-time first-team All-Pro, three-time second team. And again, it's the unique blend of being one of the best deep threats in the game for over a half decade, but also the sort of twitchy and skilled route runner in short yarder situations who could carry the load there as well. Of course, he has the 300-yard game, but one of the best seasons ever in 2015, 1,871 yards. And in a seven-year stretch, averaged 100-plus receiving yards per game six times. I think the only reason he can't be higher is... Well, maybe there's two. Longevity is not up to the highest standards of this list, although it's solid. But he was never a prolific red zone threat. Only 10 touchdowns once in his career. Only 63 in total. But man, was he special. And he and AB were just head and shoulders above the rest of the league for a half decade. Two of the greatest receivers of all time to me. For sure. They were head and shoulders above everybody else. And we do a little bit of a flip-flop here. I went Julio at eight, uh, Allworth at nine. And okay. I kind of, the only reason I, I think I put him over it is because when you judge Allworth amongst his contemporaries, it's remarkable. But I don't know, man. I saw Julio play, and he's just one of the most physically dominant receivers of all time. And again, the third most receiving yards in a single season. That 2015 season where him and AB are going back and forth, taking that crown and passing it uh, back and forth to each other week to week. Uh, over 1,871 yards. As you mentioned, the big thing I think about it, uh, about his case, the second most receiving yards per game at nearly 88, three 1,500-yard seasons, seven 1,000-yard seasons. The longevity isn't there. The touchdowns aren't there. Those are the limiting factors for Julio. But one of those complete receivers and just a guy that Matt Ryan could go to every single down. Like, he just churned out and made the Falcons a great offense every single year uh the touchdowns aren't there that's what limits him and i don't think that julio was ever a great deep ball threat i don't think julio was ever a every time i touch the ball i'm a threat to go to the house kind of guy um the way that an ab was the way that some of these don't think uh, julio was a great deep ball threat no no i'm saying that disagree no no i'm saying julio was a great deep ball threat but he wasn't a explosive like you catch a slant and take it to the house kind of the way other yeah. guys were, like I think an AB or other guys. No, Julio's an all-time deep ball, contested jump ball, 50-50 guy. But when I when you're looking at explosive plays out of you know short structure, I think some of the other guys higher on this list, like a Marvin Harrison, like an AB, are just better. But Julio's peak is all-time, and he's one of the great just give it to him and let him go to work, throw it up there, let Julio go get that ball. Uh, he was going to produce. So we flip there, Julio is number eight on my list. That size, that strength, with that kind of speed, I certainly think he was a more dynamic threat downfield than like uh, Marvin Harrison. So I have him number nine. You have him number eight. I've already talked about Lance Allworth, who's in my eight spot. Who do you have at seven? Number seven is Marvin Harrison for me. It's interesting. I think that Marvin is as good as of a deep threat. Um, when, when you look at how he was able to create separation from uh, his corners consistently, the body control... Marvin, to me, is uh, the closest comp I could give to him watching back is, honestly, Antonio Brown. I think A.B. was more explosive. I think A.B. was better in a lot of different ways, but Marvin could take short routes and take them to the house. He could he had burners and could get up the sideline. He could burn you on deep routes, and he had such, again, great body control, great feet, great hands. And I, I really do. I mentioned this last episode, Carson, but I think Marvin is criminally underrated because he didn't run his mouth. He wasn't a physically imposing guy. You know, he's like six foot, uh, a buck 80, a buck 90, but he kept to himself and he was all about business. He just handled it. Three times was all pro first team. Five times was all pro second team. Led the league in receiving yards uh, twice, touchdowns once. Had three 1,500 yard seasons. Uh, is top 10 in yards, touchdowns, receptions, and receiving yards per game. And at his peak is consistently 1,400 yards in 13 touchdowns. Super productive. But I think that everybody above Marvin, um, save Calvin Johnson and A.B., they've got better longevity. Uh, I think A.B. and Calvin have better peaks. And I think we're just more explosive big play threats than Marvin and, again, Marvin has the benefit of playing with Peyton Manning for the majority of his career, but 
I think it's criminally underrated, like I said, man, because he didn't run his mouth, because he wasn't a super physically imposing guy, mm-hmm. and because he wasn't a loud mouth like other receivers of his era, A.B., Chad Johnson, Terrell Owens, he gets a little underrated. But I think he's for sure top 10, and I think you could make an argument for him being top 5. I won't. I think Marvin's aptly ranked here at 7, but I think you could make that argument if you wanted. Yeah, he does certainly fall into a different category and that so much of the mystique around receivers is the unfathomable athletes, Megatron, Randy Moss, and the dudes who run their mouths, and he doesn't fall into either of those categories, but the production is just absolutely sensational and could arguably put him even higher on this list looking just at that. From 1999 to 2006, he averaged over 1,400 yards and 12 touchdowns. That's for eight seasons in the early 2000s where obviously the passing game and its overall production was not where it is today. Certainly one of the best route runners, most consistently open guys we've ever seen. But I do think it comes down to some other guys being some more dynamic threats. Like I think you mentioned AB basically did everything that Marvin did with that little bit of extra dynamism and agility, I would say. So Marvin was fantastic. I have him at number seven as well. And I do think it's worth noting, as you mentioned, playing with the second greatest quarterback ever for your entire career will help when you're looking at raw production. Reggie Wayne, once he came in, was going crazy every single year as well, right? And he led the league in receiving and had a 1500 yard season and tons over a thousand Demarius Thomas Emmanuel Sanders those guys both had monster 1400 plus yard seasons once Peyton got to Denver so I do think considering the totality of that I do not think he is as outstanding of an individual talent as the guys I have above him but he absolutely has to be in the top seven I would not consider him lower because of the consistent dominance of his production for the better part of a decade Yeah, and one of those guys that I think is above Marvin because of that peak, because of his physical dominance, is Megatron. And I know this is the, oh man, this was the most contentious debate in football for uh, years. Like, if you think back, uh, not a decade ago, but about five to seven years ago, uh, my best friend back home, Angelo, and I consistently had a debate at the lunch table. Would you rather have Calvin Johnson Jr. or would you rather have Antonio Brown? I always sided on AB, and I will stick to my guns here. Uh, At number six, I have Calvin Johnson Jr. And again, I think the reason I put him over Marvin, better red zone threat, more explosive, one of the most physically imposing receivers ever. And literally, just throw it up there and let him go get it. 6'5", basically 240. I mean, Calvin was a truck out there with insane physical attributes, the speed, uh, how much ground he could cover in one single stride, the leaping ability. Uh, Calvin's one of the greatest athletes of all time. Seven 1,000-yard seasons, two 1,500-yard seasons, and again, obviously, the most receiving yards in a single season ever in 2012, 1,964. He doesn't have the longevity of the other all-time receivers, but I can't blame him. He was forced to play with the Detroit Lions. Like, I get it, man. Like, you're not winning a whole lot. It's not like you got a whole lot of talent there. There's not... Your prospects aren't great if you're playing for the Lions, so I understand Calvin hanging it up a little early. Three times was first-team All-Pro, one time was All-Pro second team, led the league in receiving yards twice, and led the league in receiving touchdowns once. And again, he's third in receiving yards per game. If you want production, give it to Calvin. Let him go to work. Um, But again, I have him behind A.B. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, The longevity doesn't factor for me against A.B., but I just think A.B.'s peak, while comparable to Calvin's, I think A.B.'s peak was higher, and that is ultimately the distinction I made and why I put A.B. higher than Calvin Johnson. It was, It's still a great debate, but I'm always going to take A.B. over Calvin any day of the week. I don't know that it was necessarily ever a real debate to me just because Calvin's peak was 2011 to 2013, and then A.B.'s peak is like 2014 to 2018. So it felt to me like it was the transition from Megatron as the best to a B slash Julio kind of depended on the moment was the best, but we have very similar lists, man. I have Megatron at six, two, and this was a super 
difficult debate for me because Megatron is three-time first-team All-Pro in consecutive seasons at his prime. You mentioned the yards per game. It's number one among retired players, and I do think it's worth noting that for both him and Julio, number one in yards per game is Justin Jefferson, which isn't exactly fair because he's a couple years into his career. But if you take out his rookie year and then just go with the rest of his entire career, an average Megatron season was 1360 yards and 10 touchdowns just remarkable and then his three-year peak he averaged 1712 yards and 11 touchdowns I think he is arguably the best contested catcher ever only him and Randy really have that same combination of size and vertical ability and hands in those contexts he also just I mean 610 wingspan so his reach his catch radius was absurd with a 42 and a half inch vert. And as you mentioned, sub 4-4 speed. It's remarkable how elusive and agile he was in the open field. And I think probably the best receiver ever at using his strength and his physicality to get open, to just bully DBs. Like he was a physical problem that is only in a tier with Randy Moss throughout NFL history longevity is a bit of a knock against him i considered megatron all the way up to number three on this list and if he had been able to play a couple more years at this level probably would be higher and it is tough like i question having him even here because i think his peak is better than terrell owens who spoiler alert i have above him i don't think his peak is quite better than randy's because although i think calvin is a little bit bigger he's stronger i think arguably had like slightly better body control in terms of uh, maintaining his balance and contorting to make some of those tough catches i think randy's sheer explosiveness advantage although calvin was really explosive too uh, randy is insane there has never been a weapon to touch the football field like him i think that that actually outweighs it i also think he was a bit of an actual route runner he was just a little bit twitchier and more capable separating what do you think though i mean is that a conversation to you just peak to peak randy versus megatron who would you take that's a good question man i, I agree with you though i just think there was a different level of uh yeah level of explosiveness with randy i think randy's one of the greatest athletes to ever touch a football field they called him the freak they called me the freak man like that's what randy was like i for me the debate wasn't as much calvin as it was AB, honestly, to be higher. Like, I considered AB maybe even up to to four or three um, because of their peak. Now, I don't think I'd be able to put AB over a guy like Randy. It's an interesting debate, but I think you're right. I also think Randy was a little more technical while being a better deep threat. Mm -hmm. it, it's, an, it's an interesting conversation, yeah. too. But then again, Randy also has the longevity advantage. Peak to peak... It's tough. I can't pick against a guy who had 23 touchdowns in a single season, though, man. I mean, that's... I don't know if that record's ever going to fall. Yeah, I concur. Randy was just that little bit more explosive and more dominant in the red zone, even though they have the similar physical attributes there. Randy was, was just more productive. Okay, who do you have in that five spot? So, at number five, I have Antonio Brown, and I really do. I think... I think Antonio Brown has the second highest peak of any wideout in NFL history. He doesn't have the longevity of the other receivers on this list, but when you wow. were just looking at peak, 2013 to 2018, AB is 114 catches, 1,524 receiving yards, and 11 touchdowns, and there just isn't a hole in Antonio Brown's game. He could do it all as a receiver. Shooting up the field on go routes had insane burst was one of the fastest receivers in football had some of the greatest body control of any receiver i've ever seen when ben rifled one to the sideline ab was going to bring it in and he was going to make sure his feet were tapped in i can't tell you how many catches i saw where he saved ben's ass on a on a not as great throw where he is bringing it in and bringing it uh into his body for a big time catch the thing that separates ab from other receivers to me and why i say that he has the second highest peak though is his explosive ability and ability after the ball to dance. Uh, one, he's as technical as any receiver I've ever seen. An all-time route runner, great hands, great feet. But when he got the ball on a drag route, on a slant, on an out route, on a curl, it didn't matter. If A.B. had the ball in space to make a move and dance, he could shake anybody. 
Anytime A.B. touched the ball, he was a threat to go to the house because he could juke you out, he could spin, he could stiff arm. He was just... I miss it, man. And I, it, It's a really sad fall from Grace Carson because it hurts my heart as a Steeler fan to not see him in the league and see him finish out his career with Grace. I mean, A.B. saw the game like just in forward motion, the way a Luka Doncic or the way a Jokic could see the floor in basketball. Like, A.B. could process where he needed to go, what he needed to do to open up the field. He's truly one of the greatest big play threats, and I don't just mean that on deep balls. On any time he touched the ball was a threat to go to the house. Now, why is he not as high? Again, the longevity. It's only five five or six seasons where he is at the top of the NFL, but when you were looking at peak, and again, peak is what I value over any other stat, any other metric, how were you at your greatest? I think... I think Jerry Rice is the only thing that compares to A.B. at his peak. And I mean that with Randy. I mean that with Terrell Owens. I think Antonio Brown's peak is the second greatest of any wideout I ever saw. He is just, he's the complete, he's the complete uh, wideout, man. There's no holes in his game, man. There's no yeah. Swiss cheese here. He's the he's the total package. No. No, that's exactly how I feel, which is crazy. I think that, again, we'll probably be, in the minority here, but I have a B at five two, And I think it's what you said, man. He's probably at his peak, the most perfect receiver ever. Now, of course, Randy at his peak through sheer unrivaled athleticism, may be able to reach a higher level of production. But when you are talking about this dude to me was the best route runner in the league for a time, he had the best body control and balance and ability to make those sideline catches and, tap his feet perfectly he arguably had the best hands while being one of the most explosive in terms of pure speed and as a deep threat that's just an insane combination and the production speaks to that 2013 through 2018 he has 1524 yards per season so like in terms of yardage production only julio is going to be able to mess with that but then he's just a way better red zone threat averaging 11 touchdowns per game he's three times top three in offensive player of the year voting and twice runner up which is super super rare for a receiver like most guys even on this list are never in those sort of conversations much less multiple times i just thought that he was absolutely incredible and as close to a flawless receiver outside of being completely insane that we've ever seen even at just 510. I mean, we've never seen a red zone threat touchdown machine at that size, certainly. So, Logan, I have to agree with you. I think AD is top five, and I think that his peak is even higher than that, as is Megatron's. And that's what was tough because it's like Megatron is the slightly more dynamic threat because of his athletic attributes. But given that AB excels there too and is the more perfect down-to-down receiver who I trust to get open on that third down when I just need it to run the perfect route like that is so valuable too it was really special it was really special man and I I don't want to take it for granted like uh, I, I like I said man outside of Jerry you give me one wide out to take I'm I'm taking AB and I mean that and I played with AB up to up to top three the long again this is where longevity matters how long were you in the league and sadly uh, he quit on Tom Brady and then got kicked out of the Arena Football League. So I wish Antonio Brown the best. Um, I'm, I'm sad that it was as short-lived. At number four, I think maybe the greatest, one of the greatest football personalities of all time. You've got Terrell Owens, man. And I, I want to ask first, Carson, do you think Terrell Owens' mouth or personality elevate him or do they take him down a notch? What do you think? In terms of like just general public perception? I think it makes him more memorable. I would say it probably elevates him overall. I'd say so too. And I know that like Hall of Fame voters were like a little bit biased against, like they don't like guys that are kind of flashy and loud like TO2. But I mean, damn, I loved him so much as a kid, man. Get your popcorn ready. I love me some me, the driveway interview, that that's my quarterback, man. If you needed a sound bite, T.O. was there, but I don't want his personality. While it's great, while he's one of the great entertainers in football history, I don't want that to overshadow how consistently great he was, man. Nine times a 1,000-yard seasons. Uh, He's a six-time Pro Bowler, a five-time All-Pro first-team selection, and a three-time league leader in receiving touchdowns. 
Teal was flashy, but he backed it up on the field too, man. And all-time deep threat, a great athlete, a great route runner, and he's tough as nails too. I think a lot of people forget this when the Eagles uh, go to the Super Bowl. Teal played in the Super Bowl on a broken leg and balled out, man. Like, played through the pain barrier and performed on the biggest stage um, at his peak, which is basically, again, this is where it matters. This is where peak and longevity merge. Um, This is basically 11 seasons. He's at 1,152 yards on 78 catches. I think that's important to recognize on a, you know, uh, way more yards per catch than other guys. With 12 TDs a season, he's a great red zone threat. He's a great deep threat, great route runner, great hands. And his peak is basically twice of ABs, of Calvins, of Julios, and yeah, I mean, he's he's one of those guys who's the total package. I think that he's not as great of an athlete or physical threat of a guy like Randy. And I just think physically is in a different class than Randy. Randy is a freak, all things considered, mm-hmm. um, and a better red zone threat too. So that's what keeps him from like being higher. But all-time longevity, a great peak, and uh, a great shit talker. A, a great guy who can run his mouth. Um T.O. comes in top five. I think the longevity is what puts him above other guys. Um, But I don't disrespect him, man. His peak was very high, too. Very high peak. I mean, five-time first-team All-Pro, three-time touchdowns leader. And the totality of his career may look like it stacks up with Randy's with being number three all-time in yards and touchdowns. But I do think that that's a bit of – he has better longevity and maybe consistency year to year outside of the absolute prime years. But I think peak to peak, Randy pretty clearly takes him, but yeah, I mean a great all around receiver, right? Pretty high end speed, uh, very physical, good size, shifty in the open field. And you mentioned a historically dominant red zone threat. And I do think that that is why he has to be so high. It's that red zone dominance and, uh, Yeah, the consistency with which he was at his peak. Although, again, that's not as important to me as your absolute peak. The longevity is not as important to me. But it was a really high peak that was sustained for quite some time across different situations. T.O. was great, and I think he's tough to argue lower than this. Although, I did consider it because I would prefer A.B. or Calvin just straight up peak to peak. But the totality of what he did is probably more impressive i'm disgusted by how similar our lists are logan i really am because i feel like to is top three for probably 90 percent of people we both have him at four and we are just agreeing so much but oh we flipped on lance allworth and julio so at least uh we had that spicy debate but who do you have at number three Oh, one more thing, though. I do want to mention, I, I'm glad you mentioned that point about T.O., though. The success across different situations is very impressive. Now, granted, why was he in all of those different situations? Well, because... Yeah, we don't need to get into that. T.O. T. O. liked the drama a little bit, but he was successful everywhere he went, basically in a 1,000-yard receiver. At number three, oh, let's see if we can do it, Carson. Stride for stride. I've got Randy Moss. Um, I think he's the greatest red zone threat of all time. He's one of the greatest deep threats ever. Uh, one of the best jump ball guys ever, 50-50, throw it up, go to Randy. In classic moments too, man, mossing Revis, mossing two guys in the end zone, the three catches, three TDs, Thanksgiving game against the Cowboys. Uh, Randy's got classics on classics, man. His 2007 season, 23 TDs, uh, maybe the greatest single season quarterback wideout duo connection ever. Um He's one of two players with double-digit 1,000-yard seasons, too. I think that's important to mention with Randy. Has a great peak, is a great red zone threat, but he's also just remarkably consistent and has great longevity. And I think his career numbers, Carson, would be more impressive if he didn't have bums throwing him the ball for a couple of years in Oakland, right? He's dealing with, like, Andrew Walter and the Mm -hmm. boys out there in Oakland just kind of struggling. Shout out Bill Belichick for getting Randy Moss with a fourth-round pick. I mean, they gave him away for pennies on the dollar. Four-time first-team All-Pro, five-time league leader in receiving touchdowns, three times he's top five offensive player of the year. And at his peak, which is basically, again, 12 seasons, 1,200 yards, 12 touchdowns. Um, Yeah, man, I think Randy probably is the greatest red zone threat of all time and one of the greatest deep threats of all time. I put him over Jerry in that respect. I mean, just a freak athletically great hands, and a game-breaking talent, a truly game-breaking explosive talent. 
Uh, are we going to match, or, or do you have a, a leather football helmet wearing gentleman at number three? Logan, we are not going to match because I have Randy at number two. And to me, it's just he's in a different class as a talent from even like T.O. And his longevity is in a different class from like Megatron. So he has to be here. Five-time touchdowns leader. Also five times top three in receiving yards. Not just four-time first-team All-Pro, but when he came into the league as a rookie, he was number three in MVP voting which is just absurd for a receiver and propelled the number one scoring offense ever at the time. You say greatest red zone threat ever. I agree. You say one of the greatest deep threats ever. I think it is point blank him, man. I mean, an unofficial 4-2-5-40, a reported 47-inch vert at 6-4, just totally one-of-one one agility in the open field for that size. Megatron is great. Randy's just that extra bit twitchier quicker again one of the top two contested catch makers that we've ever seen the change of direction was instant the route running technique was better than another insane athlete like megatron it's just an absolute machine man and at number three i have don hudson who if we are going purely in terms of how these guys fared versus their contemporaries would be number two but as I briefly touched on last episode, I still mostly abide by that logic of just judging people against their peers. But the passing game itself has become so much more important that truly great receivers have become more important than they were in the 30s and 40s. But nobody, I mean, maybe not even Jerry, is more heads and shoulders above the competition than Don Hudson. Seven-time yards leader, nine-time touchdowns leader, eight-time all pro had 1200 yards and 17 touchdowns in 1942 when his team threw for 2400 yards he had more than half of the total yardage output and one of the greatest touchdown seasons that we've ever seen and the dude was just an absolute monster i think he has to be in anybody's top five like it really is almost impossible how much better he was than everybody else at that time and just because it was so long ago i don't think we should discard that part of history but i do give randy the edge for being so thoroughly dominant in a time where the passing game was just more prevalent and important yeah hear me out if we had a time machine and lined all these guys up for a pickup football game yeah look guys i'm taking randy i'm probably taking calvin and julio you know i don't really know if he stacks probably well. Probably, Logan, that's a debate for you if you want 6-5, 4-4 speed Calvin Johnson versus Don Hudson. Don Hudson pulls up to the pickup game with his with his leather helmet on, man, no face mask. Like, let's go, fellas. You know, he's ready to go. Um, yeah. It is Here comical. All right, I'm going to be playing left end, boys. <laughs> Dude, it's hilarious going back and watching these clips because I can – yeah, it's like – no, man, Don Hudson never faced a cover three, man. You know, he never faced a cover two man up. He's just burning his man in coverage because everybody else is blitzing because nobody threw the football, right? <laughs> so his highlights are pretty comical, I will say. But again, if we're judging them amongst the contemporaries, it's it, it's crazy how much better Don Hudson was. As you mentioned, 1,200 yards, 17 TDs in an 11-game season. I mean, the only guy on track with that would be Jerry in 1987 when he had 22. The Packers were a dominant offense, top three offense by points every year with Hudson, top five offense by yards every year with Hudson, 99 TDs uh, from 35 to 45, three times more than second place. Uh, it took 44 seasons for another wideout to break his TDs record. His yards from 35 to 45, over two times more than second place. He has more than two and a half times more receptions than second place. And shout out, the second place receiver. We all forget about the historically great Jim Benton because of Don Hudson Carson. Criminal, man. Um, so true. You mentioned all the times he led the league in uh, yards, TDs, and receptions. He's all pro. Carson, he was a two-time MVP, too. Like, he won the Carr Trophy. It was only around for basically a decade, but he was a two-time league MVP. Um Obviously, it's a different era. It's a different passing game. And I understand putting Randy because it's a lot more difficult. Like, point blank, period. It's a lot more difficult to, re to succeed in the modern era because they're prepared for it. 
Um, nobody else was throwing the football like this Packers offense and like Don Hudson back in the day, but that shouldn't completely take away from what he did in his era. Uh, he's one of the most dominant players ever, uh, even though it is a pretty prehistoric uh, you know, era of football. So I understand uh, going with either of them, but I think Don Hudson has to be a top five receiver for what he did in his era. Yeah, I really think he does make a case for number two, dude. It's just absurd, the production within the context of that era. I do think he belongs above T.O. I don't think T.O. was like a class above the league to the extent that you need to be for me to put you above Donnie boy. But number one, Logan, is pretty obvious who you got. Not only the greatest wideout of all time, I think Jerry Rice is the greatest football player of all time. I tell this story when we bring up Jerry, but he had soft hands because he was catching bricks from his dad who worked as a, uh, you know, as a bricklayer. Um, not Russell Westbrook. His dad was an actual bricklayer. Uh, Jerry also worked really hard, too. In the offseason, I love hearing stories about Jerry. Right after they won the Super Bowl, him and Steve Young are out there you know, catching and throwing, getting back at it. Him and Joe Montana are at the practice field immediately after winning a Super Bowl. No celebrations. We're right at back out there working. Jerry worked super hard to be great. And it's not only the peak, which is insane. It's how long he did it for. In 2002, at age 40 with Oakland, he's putting up 92 catches with 100, uh, 1,200 yards and 7 TDs. It's crazy. It's 14 1,000-yard seasons, four 1,500-yard seasons. He's twice an Offensive Player of the Year. He finished in top 10 in MVP voting six times. What other wideout is doing that? He's a three-time Super Bowl champ and a Super Bowl MVP who balled out in the playoffs. He's first in every major receiving category at his peak, which is basically 11 seasons, 1,400 yards, 14 TDs. And you cannot talk about Jerry without mentioning his historic 1987 campaign. Lockout short, 12 games, 22 touchdowns. Jerry is the most dominant football player ever, and I truly thank Carson. Uh, I mentioned unbreakable records, the far turnover record, and you countered with me. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it would take a crazy, productive, long career, and it is possible, I think, with 17 games, maybe a Justin Jefferson, honestly, it would still take him being so productive into the later stages of his career, which is, again, just a cherry on top of what Jerry was able to do at his peak. 22,895 receiving yards, 197 receiving touchdowns, and over 1,500 receptions. I don't know if anybody's breaking any of those records. Uh, for what he was able to do with the position and how he was able to directly affect winning in great offenses, I think Jerry's the greatest football player ever, man. I agree. And, I mean, I was given A.B. his props for being in the Offensive Player of the Year conversation. Jerry was top four in MVP voting three times. Ten-time first-team All-Pro. And you mentioned those unbreakable records. His lead for receiving touchdowns over Randy Moss is 41. And his lead for receiving yards over Larry Fitzgerald is almost 5,500. Like... I understand that the passing game is so much more prolific than ever and the seasons are longer, but I still don't think anybody is catching that. Uh, not for a century or so, man. I don't know. Like, nobody has outpaced their peers like this for this long at any position like Jerry Rice. It's just truly remarkable. And yeah, he had great quarterback play, but... Of course, he elevated those guys too, and he did it in situations where he didn't have great quarterback play when he's 40. There's no conversation. Jerry's number one, and I do think he is the best football player ever. Who are some of your toughest cuts, Logan? I went top 25 deep, uh, so if, if you guys want top oh, 25 good. wideouts ever, uh, we can get into it. I think this may shock some people. Carson, the first guy off of my list was Sterling Sharp, and I couldn't put him on here because of longevity, but when I think you look at pure peak, Sterling is up there, I think top five. He plays just seven career seasons. He's in double-digit TDs four times. He has two 1,400-yard seasons, and in his last season, he led the NFL with 18 touchdowns. He's got two top 10 MVP finishes, and there's this one year 
I believe his second season, Brett Favre has 18 touchdowns. Sterling has 13 of them. Like, he he made Brett on one of those seasons. Uh, at his peak, 1,200 receiving yards, 11 touchdowns from 89 to 94, excluding his rookie campaign. And he's three-time All-Pro first team, twice leads the league in touchdowns, one-time league leader in receiving yards. A remarkable, remarkable peak, and I wish we could have seen it finish. Sterling almost cracked my list. Uh, Andre Johnson, I think, deserves an honorable mention. Just did not have the uh, red zone ability. But again, the reason Andre had a legitimate case of cracking my list is, I mean, he's playing with Matt Schaub, dude. All credit to Matt Schaub, but, I mean, Andre's putting that offense on his back. Three 1,500-yard seasons, seven 1,000-yard seasons. He's all-pro first team twice and second team twice. He's a seven-time Pro Bowler. Was legitimately the best receiver in football for a period. Um, 13, I have Devontae Adams. 14th, I have Chris Carter. And 15th, I have Steve Largent. So, all of these guys. um, Then we're getting down into the Isaac Bruce's, the Torrey Holtz. I think all of my top uh, top five off, Largent, Carter, Devontae Adams, Andre Johnson, Sterling Sharp, all had legitimate cases to crack here, but just don't have the insane longevity of a guy like Larry Fitzgerald. But I definitely considered all of them. But man, dude, Devontae, Sterling, and Andre Johnson were all super tough cuts for me. I wanted them to somehow get on my list. Very interesting, man. I mean, Sterling's case is peak over everything i just don't think the peak is that convincingly better than anybody where you could put him in the top 10 i would say my two toughest cuts were probably chris carter and steve largent and i understand that maybe in terms of yardage carter doesn't have like that absolute all-time apex and he does have good longevity that helps him climb the lists but one of the great possession receivers ever just in terms of massive consistent catch numbers generating first downs and one of the great red zone threats ever he is fifth all time in touchdowns with 130 sixth all time in catches 13th in receiving yards i think the resume definitely puts him in these conversations and steve largent is another one of those guys who was ahead of his time i think the best receiver of uh, the late 70s and maybe the early 80s before jerry comes in there but not by a super convincing margin. I do think longevity puts him into these conversations, but I don't think he was better than Larry at enough by his peak to outweigh the longevity edge that Larry has. And then I thought about Tim Brown. I think another guy who was just a super consistent, really high level force, almost 15,000 receiving yards and a hundred touchdowns. But Again, never had that stretch where he was, like, clearly the best receiver in the league. And, well, of course, that was really hard to do going up against Jerry Rice. But even after Jerry's apex and isn't going to match Larry in terms of longevity. So those were my toughest cuts. I do think that Devontae is honestly going to already work his way into these conversations. I mean, incredibly prolific red zone threat and best route runner that we've seen of this past decade, probably. Jettis is going to push him hard in that conversation probably overtake him but because of the number of years for which Devontae's done it I would give him the edge there's a lot of good names out there but I think that we've covered most of them you mentioned the greatest show on turf guys I'll always love them I mean their peaks are just nuts Torrey Holt is way up there in all-time yardage but I don't think they quite compare to some of these other guys and I do think are elevated by being in a a very good offensive situation for some time there so Any final thoughts, Logan? Anything else you want to say to the people about the top 10 receivers? Or do you want to go with your full top 25? I don't know if the people are ready for that. I just want to give a shout-out to a couple old-timers. Don Maynard, Raymond Berry, and Art Powell. Uh, Great receivers of the 50s and 60s, man. How can you forget? I, of course, was kicked back, you know, watching my old box TV in black and white. uh, Right there, stride for stride with all these guys. Um, I, yeah. I, I give a shout out to the old guys. Take a look at their resumes too. Uh, Raymond Barry, Tommy McDonald, Art Powell, and Don Maynard. Uh, just I just want to give a little extra respect to the old guys because I think they can get lost to, to football history a little bit with how prolific mm-hmm. modern receivers are. Well, these guys were actually left ends and flanks, Logan. Uh, they were not playing the wide receiver position that hadn't been invented yet. 
But yeah, I think Raymond Barry probably makes the best case of all these guys. Don Maynard, he was always second to good old Lance Allworth, wasn't he, Logan? He never quite claimed that crown as best receiver in the league. He's no longer with us. May he rest in peace. But yeah, shout out to the old timers. They deserve their credit in these conversations. All right, that's going to do it for us here today, guys. As always, hope you've enjoyed. If you did, the good news is there's plenty more content like it. We are going to be starting our top 25 NBA players of all time next week. So stay tuned for that series. You can watch it on the volume YouTube page, or you can just listen to it on our podcast across audio platforms. You can follow us across social media, Twitter at nerd underscore sesh, Instagram and TikTok at nerd sesh. You can buy our merch at the volume.com. That is also linked in our link tree across our social media bios. Check that out. You can get the flags like the ones behind us. You can get hats, hoodies, shirts a lot of cool stuff and you can join our discord that is also in that link tree if you just want to talk basketball football with us trying to continue to grow that community so with that as always appreciate you guys i've been carson brabber i've been logan camden and this was nerd sash 